Well, thanks for coming and joining us, everyone. My name is Nicole, we haven't met yet, and I'm here with Maria Montero from Border Agency, all the way from Chile. And um, Border Agency is a collective of three artists. Uh, their kind of fundamental question is, how does technology mediate our experience of landscape? So I think we'll start off talking about the project that you brought here today. Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and describe what you brought for us today, where we can see it, what it looks like. Okay. Yeah. Um, the name of the project is Bosques de Fuego, but it's uh, mean like fire, uh, forest, forest, um, and and had this double meaning on, on the fire as something that it's evil that kind of destroy, but also the fire as uh, something that allows life to kind of continue in the way that uh, ecology works. So. Um, we focus on eucalyptus, and what we brought here is uh, are two pieces. Uh, one is a picture of the forest and a line of light in the forest. And the other one is what we see here, that it's a video on a plantation near a small community in Chaiwim that it's near Valdivia, that is in the south of uh, Santiago, the place that we come, we lived uh, in Chile. And has the particularity, that plantation, that it's the community live really kind of close, so they are quite engaged with the eucalyptus in a daily basis and not this economical um, uh, relationship of extraction. Mm -hmm. they, they live, they work, they kind of, experience life through the plantations yeah. so yeah they're in a kind of like dim intimate domestic relationship yeah. with yeah. eucalyptus yeah. ah that makes sense are we going to see the do you think the video loop again so we can show it if, if you can't see it it's a woman putting up her washing and then there's a kind of eucalyptus forest behind it and it's just really quiet and simple And a bit of cumbia playing. Yeah, yeah. It is actually, we were doing this film work and we didn't plan to have this video. We didn't ask that woman, and it was one of us um, sitting there wait, waiting for the rest to be ready. And it was this woman playing this video, and there was this background of, of the trees. So he started doing this video in his cell phone. Ah. So, it is a cell phone video. A little bit of a cell phone advertisement, so we should get some royalties from Apple. Not to sell. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh my god. So this is just one part of this Bosques de Fuego project, right? Yes. So it's much, it includes other components, all investigating the, our relationship to eucalyptus. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how the exhibition or the project looks when it's like fully installed or other installments. What does that look like? So we started the pro this project in 2017. We were doing this other project on landmines and we came to Valdivia. That's why we started here uh, to install this other project that was about the, the, the lands, uh, the, the mines in some places in the north of Chile. And we asked the people that attend to this kind of talk um, what they were these fragmented territories there in Valdivia. And some of them pointed out that the plantations were a way of fragmenting the territory because they were privatized. The forests were privatized, that they were no longer able to kind of cross through them. And at the same time, there were all these other um, wildfires happening in the country everywhere. Mm. Like uh, in Central South Park, especially like massive, as what happened here last summer. Mm. So we start this question on on the, the the plantation itself and how that impacts the way of, of, of experience the landscape. So we uh, we we then decided that we wanted to go through the eucalyptus. At, 
it is this special tree that has this double game that you love it. Like it has this really good smell. Yeah. And then you hate it because during all this wildfire, it was portrayed as this evil tree that makes the fire. Oh, is it super flammable? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's this double kind of negotiation that happens all the time. And also, it has this double. It is a nature, natural being. It is alive, but it's technologically modified. So it was this perfect example of this popular negotiation between uh, what is natural and what is cultural, because yeah. people perceive it in these two ways, like it's like an evil, really bad uh, artifact, and it's not alive. <laughs> but at the same time, it is like something that makes you feel great when you are sick. And yeah? Yeah. So. I think that's interesting because your previous project, as you said, was talking about landmines in the Chilean uh, landscape, particularly at the border, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it was also pointed out to you that these plantations are privatized, so they form a certain kind of, or they perform the same function in a different way as the landmines, where they make a certain plot of land uncrossable. Mm -hmm. But in the scheme of your artistic project, you guys went from looking at landmines as a technology to eucalyptus trees as a technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May I think you might have already covered this, but do you want to tell us more about how you're thinking about eucalyptus as a technology, how you're... Um, yeah, it was really kind of uh, a discovery. We, we went, we start, we start talking with different people, not just the one that uh, activism, mm -hmm. you know, but the one that had this view that things need to change, that we are in that path. Because sometimes we, we got so involved that it, it looked like we kind of have this eucalyptus teacher put on, <laughs> and not like that. Uh, but we wanted to confront ourselves to all, all what is happening, all, all those views of what is the eucalyptus in it and how they perceive it and so on. So we went to this um, Arauco company that is one of the biggest company of, with eucalyptus plantation in the country. And they have this laboratory of um, experimentations, like uh, seeded experimentation and clonage. Like they create different um, kinds of eucalyptus. Uh, so we realized that, and, and the guy that we were talking to the, him, he he pointed us that eucalyptus is this this tree that for them is super wild, and it's super it is super difficult to have this perfect tree because they always want to have this really long and with some foils on the top, so it is easy to cut and to work with. So they were always looking for that, and during the 80s and 90s, they, as the technology didn't arrive as it is today, they make these walks uh, and choosing the plantations in all around the country, the best eucalyptus, and they were the one that they were replicated. They took pieces so, of. Let me see if I understand. So they were they wanted so they're trying to cultivate the perfect eucalyptus, but it's really difficult. Yeah. So then they toured a bunch of existing plantations. Yeah. And then took those eucalyptus trees. That the one that grew faster and grew more kind of and they cloned like they, they created cloned it. Uh, cloned it like uh, to to have more more of that kind. But this is something, if they had had the technology, they would have just done it in a laboratory, sort of genetically modified the seed? It could be, yeah. In Chile, it was forbidden for a long time. Now I think that regulation changed, but uh, it, so it took them longer, maybe, to mm. kind of create this, this special tree. But what, that's what, how technology worked on that, those days. So. It is kind of man-made in a way, but mm. really in a, a bodily experience way. So it is kind of nice. Yeah, that's a kind of a really beautiful story because in one way we're trying to, you see humans trying to manage and manipulate a technology or 
a natural a tree. And at the same time, that tree has worked back on us and tried and like co-opted our labor and yeah. kind of technologized us yeah, yeah. because there was this tour that needed to happen in order to get the result we wanted. Yeah. And actually, we we take the, that idea I and mean, we invite other artists. And one of the things that we do during the project was to do this drawing work works. So we invite other artists to figure out how different they were, how each eucalyptus were unique and they were not this massive kind of plantation that we think before. They were all the same, but they aren't. So yeah, that's one of the experimentation we did. So in these like encounters that you, you staged with people and the work, because it sounds, because what you've told me about your project, there's a number of ways in which you're, re, you're encouraging people to engage with eucalyptus or view eucalyptus in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about some of those encounters that you guys have staged? We, we try to kind of interview people and to more than to make them feel and to, to perceive the complexity of what it means to, 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 to think of plantations. So we have one was this walkings, and um, we have this year this last exhibition in Valparaiso that it's also near Santiago, and it was this huge space uh, that we needed to fill on, and it was so we we booked uh, actually to some eucalyptus from from the region, and we create this balance that you can climb on and hack the eucalyptus and balance yourself through and to kind of feel the tree, but it was a dead tree though. <laughs> but this was, oh, so this was in the exhibition in, yeah, in yeah. Valparaiso? Valparaiso yeah. yeah, If you can see it on the website, there's like these hanging, it's magnificent, they're like hanging from chains, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tree trunks. And I guess you invite, I mean, do you, people just like, everyone will jump just down jump, and sort of swim? Yeah, yeah, jump up. We didn't have any, anything said. And maybe the, the guards from the, the security guys from yeah. the exhibition, they loved it. So sometimes when there were no one around, they jumped up <laughs> and started to balance. So maybe they did the work that uh, while yeah, we right. were there. So. And there was another um, encounter that you had staged as well with ceramic, right? Yeah, know? yeah. Um, but that was our encounter. What happened, it was that we, we had we had been working for so long with the eucalyptus that we fell kind of in love with <laughs> And we start to look at all the eucalyptus that were around. So we have this collection of pictures of eucalyptus around Chile, like everywhere, pretty much all of them. And, and then we start to think, okay, this is it, but what, what is lost when all this landscape will change? What, mm. what kind of tree, what it experienced? And, and then we went, we, we create the opportunity kind of to go to this forest in the south of the country that, that allows us to think on the forest critically. Because one thing is to go, I don't know, Chile is, you have plenty, plenty of wild forests and mountains and you can go camping and whatever then in your holidays and that's okay, it's nice and everything, but to go there and to think on what is the experience and, and to create work is a different thing. So we went to this um, Bosque Pehuen, but it's near uh, Pucón in the Araucanía, that's the, that is Wolmapu, that is the, the, the Mapuche territory. Uh, and we invite other artists to join us. Uh, it was Sebastián Calfuqueo and María Lara, that they are Mapuche artists. So we, we also wanted to have this other voice that was, was happening in the place, like, because there is a political issue also, mm. like in between Mapuches and uh, government and the, the ones that uh, plant the eucalyptus, the companies. So, so while we were working in the eucalyptus, all the effort was to po point out the specificity of each tree, that it wasn't one thing, but each one was an individual and they were alive. And what the issue was wha how they were uh, managed, mm -hmm. you know? And then 
we arrived in this forest and we realized that you could not think on a tree. They were, everything is interconnected. Like yeah, yeah. The, the, you have this trunk of um, cut trees because it used to be this farm that they cut wood for the kind of uh, companies or whatever uh, and sell them. But then this uh, ONG bought it and now they are kind of rewilding the, the place. So, but you have this story, the history of, of how this territory has been treated. So yeah. you have these old trees and inside them you have all these new small trees and, and, and we came about some of the guys that were there told us that these this trees put uh, like growth to the roots of the old ones. That's right. I remember you explaining this. So in the in the center of the trunk of the eucalyptus that it's already been cut down. It wasn't an eucalyptus. It, this sorry. is a wild wild. Oh, uh, just a wild Chilean tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a eucalyptus grows inside. No, another one. Just uh, another tree goes inside. Just another it. because what we want to to have the experience what what was lost when the eucalyptus arrived. You, you know what yeah. other yeah. other yeah. things were in the in the territory, what was the experience of being and something that was different than the eucalyptus. And this is, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. So then this NGO is rewilding these not yeah. eucalyptus Yeah, I think trees. because Chai Win has this uh, particularity that they rewild eucalyptus plantation and I think we talk about that. Yeah. And that's why you are mixing up. But this other place is just wild forest. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, what we did was to think on these interconnections that live on the forest and us, and how us humans came in about it. Yeah, how we can connect into this uh, network. So we create this uh, ceramics mm -hmm. that it, we took a uh, printed, like a, we put um, pieces of of ceramic, like yeah, like the plaster, right? The plaster. Like an imprint. That's really yeah. Uh, and then we we burn it and have it the pieces, and we have all the trees that we put them, and ha and also we have this walk to go through all these places, and and we were with our family, so we have our kids, and mm -hmm. and we were many, so we have all these lines that cross around and create this kind of visual networks on us in the forest. Sweet. And this this kind of uh, way of connecting with the tree and also have it. Yeah. Have the, because it's, it's an interface between the tree and the forest. But also you can see the, the like our fingerprints, hands, our fingerprints in, the in, in the in the in the piece. So yeah, that's beautiful. It's like this little like a kiss. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I might be a little too hippy dippy for this moment right now. Sorry though. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm just thinking. I want to just ask you about one last encounter with the Mapuche, and then maybe I was thinking we could in, in open up and see what other thoughts are in the room. Yeah, if any. So yeah. So tell us a little bit more about Mapuche and how that intersects with this project. So one of the things that we realized while we was, were working with Sebastian, uh, Seba Calfuqueo especially, because we have more relationship with him, it's um, that the way that they perceive nature is different than us. And Seba Calfuqueo is a Mapuche artist. Mapuche, first of all, are an indigenous, indigenous community people. for in Chile. In Chile, yeah. So they are the native of uh, Central South. So they, they have this notion of that, that it's around the Andes, that the, the word is Pachamama, mm. and that's nature, but we as humans are not as something that is separate of nature, but we belong to nature. Yeah. So if you see an Araucaria, a Bewen, that they are many in monkey puzzle uh, in England, they, they come from this side of uh, the, the, the country. Mm. So if you see, if they will say to you that they are, they belong to the Araucaria because the Araucaria, the Pehuen, it's older than them. So wow. how can they cut them or have resources? But they are the resources, you know? And the, it, it, this is that tree that's 
um, Pepe is thousands and thousands of years old. Yeah, Arucaria. Yeah, yeah, yeah the one that we saw yesterday. That all ah. excited. All right, so it's in the garden, the botanical garden. You can see in Arucaria. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And the Mapuche think that they came from, or that they're, I guess, they they're, belong to. They belong to. Yeah. The Arucaria. And and they have each animal have its own spirit, so uh, they talk about them as beings. Mm. No resources, so it's just a different way of understanding nature and not being separated, or, but being part of, it. Yeah, yeah, like kind of um, post-materialism uh, way of thinking, but like way before that happened. Yeah. So, yeah. And your engagements with your art project. What are you doing? You work with Sub Seba. Yeah, Kapukeo, and you also worked with another Mapuche Maria poet. Lara. That she's a poet, and she she works on on their dreams. So she writes on what he had. She had dream. Oh yeah. And yeah, that's and so the voice that she takes is the voice of a bird, or, oh. or the voice of a tree, or the voice of a wind. And so it's always a different purpose, per perspective on what is. And she, that's how she writes her poems, like yeah. from, as, the, as a bird, as a tree. Yeah, I, that is simplifying because it's more complex, of course, but it yeah. is quite be beautiful and it's a completely different perspective on what we are used to. In a way, I would think that we are the eucalyptus in Chile, <laughs> and they are the native forest that kind of can teach us. The Mapuche people. The Mapuche, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Should we... Does anyone want to tuck in or ask any questions? Um, no, go yeah. I just want to go if you saw my piece down there. Um, <laughs> the eucalyptus bark piece. Um, uh, yeah, there's a eucalyptus tree on the estate, so we were here like a week earlier and did a residency here to make work for the show. Oh, um, cool. And I came across this eucalyptus and the, the bark had come off like parchment, so I took some of it and, and reworked text into it um, from an indigenous Brazilian writer's work. Oh, that's nice. Uh, so, yeah, so... The uh, eucalyptus is what they see in England or it was here? Here. Yeah, yeah, there's one in the industrial estate. Ah, oh, okay. There's quite a few down on the on, yeah. the seat, on the estuary front as well. So yeah, just um, yeah. So so I suppose that kind of relationality, um, you know, that word relationality. Um, so so we do relational work is a word in that we use in visual arts to engage co-production with communities. Um, and so it seems that that kind of having a relationality with nature is a kind of way to think of that. And what I did was just imagined if the tree was talking to me, what would it say? So it's kind of like a similar. Yeah, that's, that's Can we ask what you came up with? What would it say? Yeah, um, um, well, I, like I said, I took a cut and paste um, text from this book. What's the um, book? Um, Ideas to Postpone the End of the World. Ideas to Postpone the End of the World. Yeah, by Elton Krennic. He's Elton a Brazilian indigenous writer. Um, but the idea for that is that there's a there's um, a group of people in indigenous people in Brazil who have an idea that they prop up the sky with rocks, mm -hmm. and if they don't keep propping up the sky with rocks, the sky will fall down. So you postpone the end of the world by prop keeping the sky propped up with rocks, and if they die out, there'll be no one left to prop the sky up. So it's like hope you continually postponing the end of the world. So yeah, it's right. ideas to continue postponing. Yeah. We just have to have a look later on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah definitely. Definitely. There was a few people working with you, Lifter specifically, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think we we can we have talking with other people that were working. I th I think it's quite striking the way that here in Portugal during and and great Greece also happened something similar. Mm. All this wildfire happening during the summer, so that makes to shift your view like they appear. They are not. They are not invisible anymore. The know? eucalyptus. Yeah, yeah. Like the fire kind of brings yeah, them yeah, forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. But in this way that's sort of threatening to humans, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's is the eucalyptus like an invasive species in Chile that's been bought in? It is an invasive. Or is it yeah, it is invasive. Is it native to Chile? No, they they are from Australia. 
so they are they so they came, bought in. Yeah, they bought in. And then selectively bred, like you said, to have certain properties. Yeah. Um, yeah, they are like in the country in the nineties. In the nineties, right? Okay. Yeah, massively. Before that, they were this this uh, scientific that brought a few of them thinking mm -hmm. on uh, the property that the tree has because it's a really fast tree. I think yeah. it's the fastest tree in the world, yeah. and it grows mm -hmm. really good for wood. So he he brought brought it. To Chile from the state, actually. Sorry. Was it from Northern California? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because it was brought to Northern California similarly, but then I think they decided they didn't like it for whatever they brought it for. But then this guy, yeah, the, the, mm -hmm. this guy brought some seed back to Chile and they had it like, but they are the old ones. They are beautiful. They have this massive kind of trunks that you can see and they have been living in there for 100 years and they don't affect the way that plantations affect because the way that they are managed so it's not that and it's not proliferate and get invasive like no they kind of have one and two yeah so yeah and part of the life cycle of eucalyptus is the fire because that propagates yeah yeah the rest of it, which would be okay in, in, in an arid desert sort of like Australia but that doesn't really work for but you know there are different kind of eucalyptus and different kinds of uh, behaviors um, and in some parts of part of Chile there are similar uh, trees that need fire to kind of re Propagate. rebuild the fire were uh, volcanoes that mm -hmm. kind of came into be, like Araucarias are really resistant to fire mm -hmm. because they live in near places where volcano are, volcanoes are. So the, the, this fire came in and kind of gave better kind of soil, so mm -hmm. new trees came about and, and that make the forest came and replicate itself. So, mm -hmm. so this, this sort of idea of, of a non-dualistic view of nature is, is um, global, um, it seems, from the like yeah. all indigenous communities yeah, that yeah. I've researched have the, a similar or same view. Yeah. So um, I did some research as a um, science, like your external PhD, um, Brian Bates, yeah, yeah, yeah. at Sussex. Um, he wrote a book called The, um, with the, the Way the Weird, wasn't it? Yeah. So he, he, he basically took early Christian um, writings of early Christian missionaries' writings about their relationship to indigenous Western, specifically English communities. Um, and they, and their kind of, their um, destruction of, of a kind of worldview that had a, a like na nature being sacred. Um, and it seemed to be, and that he researched it from the, 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 the archive of, of missionary publications from that period. Um, and it seemed that, that from what, what I remember he said, um, that the missionaries um, said that you can't, you can't worship a tree or a stream or a mountain because God made the tree for man, in the book comes. Um, and if you, so, so that it was made for man. Um, and so if you worship it, you're profaning God, but that's just a colonial kind of approach. Yeah. That's just a means of control. I don't even know if they believed it at the time, but that was just to deconstruct the worldview of the, but it's just taken so much currency that we still have in our mainstream Western view. Yeah. We still have that as being true, yeah. which is bizarre. Yeah. When you see the global nature of kind of relationality with nature is just so strong and, and it's happening. It's deep, as you know, you know, it's being deconstructed still yeah i would say it, this this is the way all colon, colonies works mm. and it's difficult to uh, even that we have this view that are rich and complex and there are different experience of a uh, relationship with nature and and to think on humans are part of it and i don't know brazilian people grew uh, vegetables and and stuff in the forest so they mix things and they they create this way of that are more complex and ecological for the well-beings of every uh, being in that place so even if that exists we still have this kind of economy that it take it is in place so it, it is impossible to change it even in chile like the past year we have been thinking of having this new constitution so it was it was beautiful it was uh, 
popular. It was people from all around the country came in to be, they were native, native people that uh, was part of this, this, um, uh, this way of writing the, the new constitution and, and they came with a piece that was uh, thinking of nature as its own rights and, and as a being in the collective and native people as, 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 as part of Chile, so as a pluricultural country. Uh, but last September was reject rejected. So the issue is not just, it's kind of in the roots of the way that we think. So it is not something in the past, it's quite present. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not that colonial, it's just the way that... And people were really concerned. I remember to have all this conversation of, the, of people kind of laughing, like, what do you mean that nature have right? Like, like this tree will have right and will be chosen over me? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that will make us more kind of have the idea of a future. <laughs> mm. I mean, one way or another, I think that tree is getting chosen over all of us. There's no trees, I guess, there's no, I mean, to be ridiculously simplifying. There's yeah. no trees, there's no oxygen, there's no humans. Bye bye, baby. Us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, I thought it was interesting that we were trying to get trees for this, and in the end we couldn't get trees, could we? And it, it turns out that they've started to implement some laws against selling eucalyptus trees in Portugal. Yeah, they, they, what they did, it's quite intelligent in a way, uh, but kind of perverse in another. They, they create this law that they divide the country and there are some part that you can grow eucalyptus now and some other that you cannot. So the one that have the right to, they need to have a, like a certificate. So you cannot buy to anyone eucalyptus, you need to buy for the ones that have the right to grow them but didn't change the way they grow them. So it doesn't make any sense. It's just you have these places that you, you don't care if they burn and the people that live around. But in some ways I'm struck by the fact that, I've been, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know how eucalyptus trees sort of naturally spread. But in some ways- They don't. Oh, they don't. You no. have to plant them. Yeah. There's not like a bird that takes the seed somewhere else. It could be, of course. But even just the possibility of that, it strikes me, there's something sort of darkly funny slash tragic in the sense that we're gonna control. Only some people can grow eucalyptus. As if we have that much control, as if we have that capacity. I think, I think in the other places you can have it, but you cannot cut them and sell them. That's the so you can have them, but you can't. I mean, but all of this just seems like sort of futile, right? And, and futile to the point of absurdity. And it's, I think some of the conversation points in the, in the room, as well as what you brought up about, um, and I don't remember if we covered it right now or in another conversation, about the plantation serving as, a, as sort of a barrier for undocumented people trying to pass into Chile. Do we cover that here? I don't think. Do you want to no, tell no, us about no, no, that? It was the landmines. But didn't you say also that people, no, the no. privatized plots? No, no. Yeah, uh, but because the people that are coming to Chile are in the north. Yeah. What is happening. And these are in the south. So, oh, oh, oh. So, yeah. I got it wrong. Yeah. In any case, I think there's still a theme <laughs> that I will recover. I will work very hard to recover. <laughs> There's a, sort of a complex problem here about control and cohabitation. Because on the one hand, we've yeah. offered the solution of we're going to extend human, we're going to extend rights, this rights framework to nature. And I know, at least in the United States, some of the conversation around that is that perhaps maybe, you know, you can't get better in the same place that made you sick. So perhaps a rights framework, a constitutional framework, as we've always lived with one, just making it bigger and bigger and bigger in these different ways might not be a solution, the solution, maybe we need to think on something more complex. So I'm thinking about also the ways that um, this eucalyptus crop has sort of intersected with transnational yeah. commerce, with its, you know, it's present on a, on, a, on a state, it has some kind of presence in the light of different uh, social classes. I don't know how it functions in Chile. I don't know what the question is in this, because I had a great question before, but then I found out I was wrong. <laughs> but there seems something complex with control and co cohabitation. Perhaps that, 
Yeah, there is a beautiful book, um, Waving Basket, Waving Nature. Did you read it? Yeah, we put it in Yeah, oh, I have that. Yeah, and, and I think that's the point. It's on yeah. reciprocity. Like, yeah. you need to think on trees and nature in general and, and on, on your well-being, not as something that is separate from it. We are our community. All this, all the thing that nature is perfect. No, it's not. In some places, work. Some other. You need to help. Her. Like, and, like she and puts them in a nice relationship that you're not dominating, but you're also not just like totally hands off. It's yeah. like an interaction, and people are involved with plants and whether they grow or not in the indigenous community as well. Yeah. So the the, the case that she in this book analyzed is the the. Some what was the name of it? Sweet grass. Sweet grass. So mm -hmm. sweet grass need to be taken off, but respectfully. Yeah. So the one new one can grow. So it needs man needs to be part of the process of of being of that species being. You know. Uh, but and even you, just like you a don't need to cut it all. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. this kind of one or the other binarism. It's just yeah. I think it's reminding me of how some of the and I can't remember now, I'm not going to be able to properly cite it, but some of the discussions around, you know, in again, in the United States, we're like going through a moment of maybe um, appropriate reflection, thinking about if the state is not going to care for us, how do we provide care? How do we support communities in that absence, in that vacuum? And then there's been a lot of discussing mutual aid, especially, I mean, this must have been a conversation everywhere during the pandemic. And yeah. there's... I'm in Philadelphia, which has a number of sort of mutual aid initiatives. And one of the ways that um, the reframing that I really liked was like, to whom am I obliged? Who do I have obligations to? So it's not that you are responsible for more than you can give. You're not responsible for everyone and their mother, but you are in relation with people, with things, with places that obliges you in some ways, or you have kind of commitments or you need to make commitments in those ways. So it's not also totally transactional or about reciprocity. It's also just about um, that braiding, I think is a really great visual metaphor. How do we braid into relation together in a way that makes us strong, but also independent. We're three independent strands that come together. Yeah. There's this Brazilian, uh, maybe it's the same book that you have there, that talk about uh, relationships and relationship with nature and, mm. and how important it is not to think on relationship between human and non-human uh, instead of trying to I don't know conserve uh, certain species to think on the place that spe that species is mm. and how you you need to understand how community kind of relate to that species like the whole complex of, of being absolutely uh, not the relationship but the relationships yeah the many relationships yeah. all at the same time which is I mean just like a difficult it's like a bit of a mind mill isn't it i think we're all we're being asked in this moment if we're going to meet the urgency of the moment to pull two things in balance at the same time both like a very hyper local space and a global impact and it has to be both at the same time yeah, yeah. i think i don't know hopefully but yeah. still new constitution are rejected <laughs> that was a bit of a heartbreak it is Maybe it's not over yet. Who knows? Eternal options. Yeah. No run. Right. <laughs> yeah, here we've got like 10 minutes or so. But it's it in the bounce, good luck. All right, here it goes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we need the music, you know? Yeah. <laughs> now we're going to have to do the salsa yeah. classes now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. To Latino. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.